your camera off. A um, little bit about me. I'm Nick. I'm a partner here at Further Faster. Um, we call ourselves a venture studio. We work with pre-seed, seed stage companies uh, at one of three inflection points in their journey. One, it's an idea stage company. Um, you got to find your, your first customer cohort. We'll help you find them and get some early traction for fundraising. Two, uh, you're funded, but you're kind of plateaued. You've got a little bit of product market fit, but things aren't moving as fast as you'd like. And three, you've got some funding, uh, you've got product market fit, but you're looking to chart a new path, new feature. And that's where we come in. We're experts at research and design. And Raj's services are super helpful to all of the companies that we work with pretty much. And he's a trusted partner of ours. Um, knowing how to pitch and sell is vital at all three of the stages I just mentioned. Um, and so Raj is going to teach us some of the nuances, the craft, the science, the art uh, behind pitching. Um, and I'll, I'll say hello and goodbye at the end of the call, uh, but I'll pass the mic over to you, Raj. Awesome. Thank you, my man. Appreciate it. Thank you. And big shout out again to Further Faster for um, allowing me to take the Zoom stage with them and bring this content to everybody today. Some of you in here are familiar faces. Some of you are brand new. So again, just if you want to take a second in the chat as I'm getting started here, let us know uh, where you're from, uh, what you're working on. Uh, always helpful to have a good context in that sense. Today is uh, Startup Hype Man's flagship, and I'll get into a formal introduction in a few minutes, but like this is uh, our, our flagship training, and it is in fact called How to Not Suck at Pitching Your Startup. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, appreciate everybody being here. And again, let me, get, let me just get my uh, Zoom things figured out here, my screens situated. Um, just so you're aware, a little housekeeping before we dive in. Um, there are going to be a couple parts where I ask for some volunteers. There's going to be parts where I ask for uh, you to come off mute to just do some fun stuff together. Uh, I've also got my chat window pulled up here alongside everything else. So um, definitely use the chat throughout this. Uh, and if you've got questions, uh, drop, your, drop them in the chat that themselves and we'll try and keep up with it and make sure we answer your questions. All right. So with that said, welcome everybody to how to not suck at pitching your startup. My favorite, favorite, favorite training to deliver. Real quick to kick off, I want to just share with you the mission of Startup Hype Man. You've probably heard nine out of 10 companies fail. You may have also heard women and minority funded companies, founded companies get a ridiculously low amount of venture funding. To me, this is all an environment that is designed for failure. And so our mission with Startup Hype Man is to use the power of story to make success inevitable and not the exception. And I like to say we can create a new reality where the three inevitables of life are that yes, you will die. Yes, you will pay taxes. But in that in between those things, your startup will actually make it. And I think the more we can prioritize story and getting our message across, the better shot we have that becoming the reality and the inevitable. So all that said, you all tuned into a live workshop today. What you didn't realize you also tuned into was a live interactive game show called Pitch Your Startup. That's right. It's Pitch Your Startup, the only live Zoom featured interactive game show where a room of entrepreneurs are unknowingly and unwittingly pit in front of their peers where they have to do none other than, you guessed it, pitch their startup. So what I would like is one contestant to come on down from the crowd. I will put 60 seconds on the clock and you will have the opportunity to pitch your company. Who would like to be our lucky contestant? Andy jumping to the forefront in the chat there. So Andy, before you get started, first off, everybody, whether your camera is on or not, even on your own, just give Andy a little round of applause for being our guinea pig here. Yeah, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. Um, now, Andy, what I would love, before you get started, just let me know, am I going to be a potential investor or am I a potential customer? Yes. <laughs> okay. That's just nice. yes to both. Uh, <laughs> you're going to be a customer, actually. Okay, cool. Well, so I'm a potential know, customer. Right? I'm going to put 60 seconds on the, wait, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me put the timer up here. You got to follow the game show rules. All right. I'm going to put 60 seconds on the clock. Go. So Raj, I know you have a lot of things on your plate and you, you have a lot of stuff to do. And uh, one of the things that I find difficult is to find people that actually help me along my process of growing my business. And I'm sure that's no different for you. Now, 
the U.S. is an awesome, awesome market full of awesome people. And there are things that we can get in the U.S. that we can't get elsewhere. But for everything else, we've got a huge pool of resources outside of the United States. What ExoScout does is it finds people that are looking to um, be a part of your organization and, and be no different than the guy who sits next to you at your desk. And we find those people overseas and we place them in your business. And in addition to saving money, you also get to get to um, take advantage of other differences in time zones and languages and culture. And that's what we do. We're able to find people, we're able to find talent overseas that's going to help you build your business. And time, right? Clocked in at exactly 60 seconds, about 59.99 seconds. Everybody give Andy a round of applause. So Andy, Hello. stay with me here for a second before you go back to mute. Um, I want to know, like, how did you feel delivering that? And, and if you were going to score yourself on a one out of 10, where would you score yourself? So I, I would give myself a solid 2.5. Um, okay. The truth is I didn't really come prepared. Uh, I've never pitched. I, that's not really true. I, I, I not really pitched a business before. I, I pitched a service, but this is a little bit different. It feels a little different. And I didn't expect to take it seriously, uh, but I did. So my heart was pumping. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, awesome. I, so Nick wrote in the chat way better than 2.5. Nick, go ahead and give your quick, maybe like 10 second assessment. I, I love it. I, I it, it came across that you had, um, some extra expertise in the space and you start off with an empathetic story towards the the customer explaining a pain point that you know they had i think it's a really great way to start i'm sure raj might disagree because he knows more than me but um i think it was a, it was a really strong opening could have imagined maybe a little bit more uh maybe a bit more energy in there channeling raj's game show voice right now but uh yeah i think it was a really great uh pass anyway better than 2.5 I agree. I think it was, I, I think you're being very hard on yourself. I think it was way better than 2.5. I'm actually surprised that is the first time you're ever pitching because it didn't, it didn't sound like that whatsoever. Uh, you're actually way better than most people who to, to guinea pig in that sense. Uh, I have to cut them off because they haven't finished talking and they are like well beyond 60 seconds. Right. The time uh, and they've talked in too. circles. Yeah. <laughs> So you were concise. You were literally right on point with the time. Uh, I, I do think there's room for improvement. I think I probably put you maybe around like a six or so. Um, but I definitely want to give you the tools and the resources to get to at least two points higher than that, maybe all the way to a 10. Does that sound good? Sure. Awesome. And, and there are certain things that you did that I'll uh, try to remember to call back to when we get later on in this, that I think you did implement well that we'll talk about later. Now, just as a quick heads up, today's content is going to be dedicated to three things. The mindset you need to have uh, around pitching, followed by a very specific uh, formula around developing your positioning, followed by a very specific formula for developing your elevator pitch as a company, whether that's to customers or to investors. This, the entire version of this workshop also includes a section on creating your investor pitch deck for those of you who are raising capital. It, the only problem is to do all of that, it takes 90 minutes to get through everything. So today we're focusing on everything but the investor pitch deck stuff. But in a follow-up email, what you're going to get is what I call the director's cut version of this workshop, which will include all of that information around building a very strong investor pitch deck. So today is going to be dedicated to the elevator pitch, which I think is always the first step towards creating, you know, a better pitch overall anyways. So once again, big, big shout out to Andy for being our guinea pig. And those of you real quick who did not jump to the opportunity the way Andy did, I'm curious to know, and you can use the chat here and kind of just talk out your thoughts. Um, why didn't you jump to that opportunity? Why did you choose to sit back? Um, why didn't you say, no, 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 I want this opportunity? Perhaps, I don't know, maybe you were uncomfortable. Maybe you don't know what your pitch is. Maybe you, uh, you know, maybe you were worried you're going to say the wrong thing, right? Stage fright, perhaps, right? Maybe that's how you feel as a founder. Language and kids are around. <laughs> There's also that as well. So here's the thing. A lot of founders, and you know, I, I do this workshop a lot, and a lot of founders choose to sit back. Uh, oftentimes, I think Andy was actually, again, an anomaly in that he jumped to it. Oftentimes, I have to pull someone out of the crowd, if you will, to be like, okay, you're going to be the person. And so I want you to know if you felt like, uh, you know, Kenny wrote, I really like to be the first penguin in group settings. I get you. 
And, you know, if that's how you felt, like, like you didn't want to be the one to go, I just want you to know, like, you're not alone in that feeling. That's how most entrepreneurs feel. That said, you're not alone, but it's also not okay. Because you need to know what your pitch is. Like you need to have it ready to go on the spot. Cause what does not happen, like you're never going to get an investor, for example, to walk up to you and say, not right now, but 24 hours from now, I'm going to meet you back here in this spot. And then I want you to pitch me. But right now I'm, I'm just giving you the one day heads up so you can prepare yourself, right? Like you're going to be out at events. You're going to be having conversations where people will just ask you, okay, tell me what your company does. And you don't really have an opportunity to be like, uh, come back to me tomorrow and I'll have a good answer for you. So you're not alone in this, but I want to make sure we all have a better answer and we can do this on the spot. And today, as we go through this content, I want to share with you another founder who's just like all of you. And I want to share with you his story. And his name is Carson Goodale. He is the co-founder and CEO of a startup out of Chicago, where I'm based. And that startup's name is FanFood. Now, Carson took an incredibly early version of this workshop several years ago. And afterwards, he was like, hey, man, like my pitch sucks. Like, I really think we could, I could use some help with this. Like, can you help me? And I was like, yeah, definitely. Let's work on this. And so the first thing I did was I was like, let's see what you got right now. And so I put him on camera and I was like, can you pitch me? And just to give you some context, like he was, this was at a stage where their company was developing their MVP. They were looking to gain some initial traction in the marketplace. They had a couple of beta users uh, and they, they really wanted to gain investment because at, at a personal level, Carson was like, I know my team is capable of building something great. I know we've got a really good product in the making here, but you know, let's, let's take a look at his pitch, right? So I put him on camera and I said, all right, man, give me your pitch. What do you got? Here's what he said. All righty, FanFood is a mobile concession app that allows fans at live events to order concessions from their phone. They can choose to have it delivered to their seat or they can pick it up through an express line. The value add for the end user, the fan, is that we're gonna maximize the user experience. The value add for the venue is that we're gonna increase the revenues and the per caps. Yeah, that's it. So. Eh, right? Go ahead, use the chat here. Scale of one to 10, how would you grade that? <laughs> There's a 2.5 from Valerie. <laughs> <laughs> three from sumo yeah yeah <laughs> and i just want to confirm you all you didn't just hear that you can see the screen too right yeah yeah okay cool, perfect yara gives it a two uh sumo says the idea right. is a the nine. idea is solid yeah. and yeah, this is a great is moment solid. where you're like oh the story matters and the way you pitch because you know if it doesn't come across then there's an opportunity there's an opportunity missed i mean yeah if you look at it like First off, the delivery is totally flat. I want that product, but not from him. That's really funny. Uh, the delivery is flat, right? Um, it's it's spoken in a very, very technical, like rote way, like down to the point of saying the value add for blank is blank. The value add for blank is blank. And by the end of it, he just looks off to the side and he's like, that's it. That's all I got. Like he can't wait to be finished with that process. And so I was like, all right, now I know that our now I know our base is. I think we can build up from here. And so what I want to share with you is their journey uh, in telling you how we're going to, how you can pitch your own startup. Um, and I want to share with you exactly how you can improve your own, uh, your own pitch process and your pitch journey and have a lot of success in the process. And again, this was a company that MVP, and, and it was kind of funny. I remember at that time, it was kind of like daydreaming mode. Like, you know, we got a couple beta tests of a couple of venues right now. Like, and, you know, they were Chicago based. It was like, oh, this would be, I remember sitting there being like, this would be perfect at a Cubs game. Like I would love to have this at a baseball game. So again, uh, if you don't know anything about me personally, if you're new to me, I just want to share with you the reason why I care so, so much about this topic is because my fundamental belief about life is that everyone deserves a voice. Now you have to use your voice responsibly, but I do believe that everyone ultimately deserves a voice. And everyone deserves to be seen and everyone deserves to be heard. And that belief in the power of voice is what fuels all of my professional and creative pursuits. So a little bit of background on me, if you don't know, aside from doing Startup Hype Man, I'm also a hip hop artist. Uh, in fact, one of the projects I'm working right on right now is the first ever startup mixtape, um, which will be available on Spotify probably in late summer. 
Um, so it'll be, think of it, mixtape of, found, of founder focused original rap songs uh, documenting the journey. Um, go ahead, Nick. Do you have something to add? Just, okay. just hyping you up, just hyping up the hype, man. <laughs> Uh, so that, that idea of voice is what fuels uh, my, my journey as a hip hop artist. I'm also a yoga instructor. And I look at that as being able to help give people their own version of physical expression and mental and spiritual expression. I also am a professional ring announcer for MMA. I actually, this coming Friday night, I've got a gig, which you can stream uh, live through the internet, through artofscrap.com, um, where you know my job in that arena literally is to help give these fighters their voice, right? Help get the crowd on their side. And I take all of that, and that's what I also infuse into Startup Hype Man as our chief pitch artist, working with companies to help them figure out what is their voice, what is their story, what is their narrative, what is their pitch. And so that's the background that I bring to you today. And I hope you just, you understand, like that's why I really do care so much about all of this stuff. And when I look at the pitching world, I look at what have I learned from these other avenues to say, how do we make it work in this avenue as well? Um, some places you may have seen me in before, or maybe not, I don't know. But like, uh, if you like TED Talks, um, go ahead and look mine up. I did it like eight years ago at this point. It was on vulnerability, but it was before Brene Brown made vulnerability cool. Uh, or at least I had never heard of her at that point. Uh, so go ahead and check that out. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I've been, what's been cool is the announcing stuff has been broadcast on like NBC Sports and stuff like that. And now... Now I am featured on the uh, the Chicago Cubs network, the Marquee Sports Network, every now and then with uh, some of these announcing gigs because uh, it's broadcast there. What we've been able to do at Startup Hype Man has been pretty badass over the years. Um, this is actually, I think, a little bit outdated, but 30-something cities, startups in 30-something cities, seven countries, four continents, haven't pulled off Antarctica yet, unfortunately. Um, we've been able to help companies generate millions through capital raises and uh, increased sales. And we've also put together uh, over two dozen pitch competition wins or top three where there was prize money on the line. Um, so essentially, um, I've, over the years, I've had a lot of experience in this. And even like the strategies and like the expertise has been tweaked as a result through more and more learnings over time. And again, I share all this with you to show you just like, I care deeply about this stuff. But if you don't want to take my word for it, I suggest you take this person's word for it. This guy's name coincidentally is also Raj. His name is Raj Bhargava. I like to joke that he is like the Michael Jordan or the Tom Brady of entrepreneurship because he is a, I think he's an eight time founder with four or five IPOs under his belt two acquisitions and he's like on the board of his seventh company and still running his eighth. And I look at like acquisitions and IPOs as like the championships of startup land, right? So this person is like got as many rings as Tom Brady does. Um, he had one of the first 50 or 100 website, like public websites ever, which is just crazy. <laughs> Uh, his first company was responsible for getting brands like ESPN on the internet. Think how crazy it is. They have a streaming network now. His first company was responsible for getting them online in the first place. Uh, he co-authored a book called The Startup Playbook, which is somewhere in my bookshelf back here. Highly recommend everyone read that. It's like an A to Z manual, everything you need to know about building a company. The Startup Playbook. He also helped launch Techstars. And I had the opportunity to have him on my podcast a few years back. And I asked him, I didn't even tee him up. I was just like, hey, what's an area companies need to really focus in on? And here's what he said. I think messaging is one of the most important things startups can focus on, and it gets glossed over all the time. I think most companies fail at it, and that's probably why a lot of them actually fail overall. If you don't want to take his word for it, though, take this next person's word for it. His name is Sean Amarati. Uh, so it's on the slide there. Um, Raj Bhargava, or Raj, there's his full name. If you don't want to take his word for it, take Sean Amarati's word for it, who said, hey, how you end up like a WordPress or a YouTube? is you have your foundational elevator pitch extremely tight. It really is the core building block upon which you can build all the different communication important for your business. Sean is a professor of entrepreneurship at Carnegie Mellon University. He also authored a book called The Science of Growth, another book I highly recommend that you read. And what him and his research team at Carnegie Mellon did was they looked at uh, seemingly identical companies in seemingly identical markets and then they studied what caused, what, what were the factors that pushed one to success and the other one to stall out? So how did one scale or another stall? So for example, um, we've all heard of YouTube, but there was a time when there was a YouTube and there was also a company called Rever. And so he looks at that. We've heard of Tesla, we may not have heard of Fisker. What caused Tesla to succeed where Fisker did not? 
And so it's a really good, like, uh, really good read, whether you uh, want to read it or listen to the audio book on what are the factors that really help you contribute to scale and growth. And one of the things he says is, you know, he was on my podcast as well. And that's where he mentioned, hey, like the elevator pitch is so important because it's not just what you're saying in those 30, 60 seconds. It's also that foundational communication where you can layer on all your messaging on top of. If you don't want to take his word for it, please take Kayla Weisberg's for it. She's an active investor and she flat out told me, story is everything. Without it, we cannot invest. So can we all agree that story is important? Yeah, put a capital S in the chat if we can all agree that story and your pitch is important. Good, a bunch of S's in the chat. What I would like everyone to do now, as long as you're able to, given your, uh, your home setup, is come off of mute. And I just want to do a quick call and repeat now that we can all agree story is important. I'm going to say it and I want you to repeat after me. So go ahead and bring yourselves off mute. My product does not mean shit. Go ahead. My product, My product does not mean, does not mean shit. shit. Without a compelling story. Without a compelling, without a compelling story. story. And all together. My product does not mean shit without a compelling story. Go. My product does not mean shit without a compelling story. Okay, good. Thank you. You can go back on mute. I want you to ingrain that in your head. Your story development is as important as your product development, if not more important. So let's talk about how we actually work on this stuff, right? Because if you come back to Carson and Fan Food and what their situation was, right? Like they want to, they wanted to raise money, they wanted to break into the market. Like, what do we all we, we can all acknowledge that this stuff is important? And let's look at like what do we care about at the end of the day, right? Because that's what Carson and Fan Food were in. Like they cared about. Money. I think that's what we all care about at the end of the day, right? We want to raise capital. We want to generate revenue for our companies. And if you don't want to be that direct about it, you can also expand the definition, right? How do we create economic impact with our work? How do we create jobs with what we're building, right? These are all the things that matter to us. And they all come back to this idea of like, how do we generate the dough? And that's what's on everyone's minds. But it can be really tough to get there when you're feeling tongue tied, right? And we come back to that idea of, pitching your startup at the very beginning of this workshop, a lot of you, you know, only one person really jumped at the opportunity right away. And that was Andy. And maybe if you were sitting back, you had a little bit of stage fright. I don't know. Maybe you felt a little bit like this. The dog, uh, the dog, you put the food in the thing, uh, and then the dog sees it and, uh, <clears throat> food's dangling, dangling, uh, it's dangling, uh, dog, 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 Looks a dang dang, tail wag wag, uh, dog wag and a tank, uh, whatever dog's name is. Dog's name is Claire. Claire, come in. Who's, who's, uh, Claire sees dog food. Pick Facebook, like, like, like. Sizzle. Pick. Strategy. Strategy. Sex. Sex. Something. Something. Some, something. Something. This is the worst pitch I have ever seen. So there's your. Uh... There, there's our uh, little, you know, fun little pitch there. But I think it's something that in a way we can all relate to, right? Just the idea that like, it can feel like almost like your tongue is swelling up in your throat or like you're stuttering over yourself uh, and that you don't necessarily know what you're trying to say. We know that doing this stuff is important. We all acknowledge that. We also know it can be pretty difficult. So what is that delta, right? What is it that's holding everyone back? You can still see the screen, yeah? Okay, great. What is it that's holding everyone back? Well, I call it the messaging treadmill. And the, I call it that because it's like, we know this is important, but it just kind of feels like we're running in place whenever we try and figure this stuff out because there's something that's holding us back. And in, at this point, over a thousand conversations with different founders, um, these are the top three prevailing reasons for being on the treadmill. Uh, not necessarily in order. These are just the top three reasons. Being too in the weeds of your own company, being uh, too technical, like maybe you're really like you built the product and you know product, but you haven't thought about the communication of the product. And or being too caught up in the day to day, right? you have like a million other responsibilities. So then figuring out how do I dedicate time to just figure out a pitch strategy is another responsibility on top of that, that just keeps getting pushed to the side in favor of these other things. Right. Uh, and this is, and you know, the unfortunate thing is that all of this is wrapped up in this inconvenient bow known as entrepreneurship, which has this ongoing mental crisis as a result, right? Like we're all entrepreneurs. So the emotions we experience in a single day, it sometimes takes other people an entire year to 
experience all of those emotions where, you know, it's like 7 a.m., you get up, you make your coffee, you're feeling good, you check your email, and then you find there's a bug in the app and you're like, oh my God, we're doomed. And how are we ever going to make it you know, if this happens? And then 10.30 rolls around and you're like, oh, wait, sweet, the bug was fixed. And yeah, okay, fine, we're going to be fine. 11 a.m., you get a potential customer who reaches out. And you're like, oh my gosh, a potential customer. We can do this. Noon, an existing customer is like, everything crashed for me. And you're like, oh my God, how we, we, we're never going to make it. And then an investor turns you down an hour after that. But then you get interest from another investor an hour after that. And it's like, all, somehow we go through all this in a single day and then still go to bed and get up and do it again the next day. Right. It is like, it's a lot that we go through. And Tim, Tim's like, I'm crying over here. That is my everyday. Yeah. So when all of that's going on, it can be really hard to even have a positive opinion about your own company because you just, you know, too much about what's going on in the background. Carson and fan food were really stuck with numbers one and three being two in the weeds and two caught up in the day to day using numbers one, two or three in the chat. Just let me know, like, which one of these do you feel apply to you, whether it's, you know, multiple of them or just one of them? Uh, what do you feel best represents your situation? Nick saying three, Tim saying two and three. So it looks like this stuff is resonating. Matt's at a one and a three. Teresa's saying all, right? So this is like, it can be really tough to figure this stuff out. So the first lesson, and again, Carson and Fanfood were, were with, we, in the weeds and too caught up in the day-to-day. -day. So I was like, okay, man, let's slow down, slow down. And the first thing we need to do is reframe how you're thinking about this in the first place. So let's talk mindset. The first lesson I want everyone to take away today is do not think like an entrepreneur. Stop thinking like an entrepreneur altogether. And instead, think like an entertainer. Why? Because an entertainer is concerned with one thing. How do I make my audience feel something, right? How do I move them in some way? Think of your favorite musician. When you go and see them live, you know what they don't do? They don't say, all right, everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. Yeah. Okay, great. So check it. Tonight, we're going to play every song from our entire catalog. That's nine albums, 14 songs per album. We don't just want to stop there. We also, on top of that, we want to share with you uh, some of our B-sides and our remixes and just some working drafts we've had in the garage. We also want to give you a window into what's on our uh, music roadmap over the next three to five years. Uh, and it's going to take uh, 27 hours to get through it all. Who's with me? Right? Even the most diehard fan will be like, what? Dude, play the hits already. Come on. That's what I came for. Right. Like you don't go through every possible aspect and they don't play every single song because they can or because they like those songs. They create a set list and they stick to that set list and they curate that set list based off of what do I want my audience to feel? What energy do I want them to have? What do I want them to leave this arena buzzing about? Right. That's how the set list is generated. And because they have a set list, that's what also enables the rapper to do an impromptu freestyle and it not be a total derailment, right? The set list allows for slight deviations here and there, but the entire thing isn't just like figured out on the spot and they don't just hit you over the head with everything. You know how many entrepreneurs want to tell you every last feature that may exist in their product and not just that, but everything that's going to be on the roadmap in the next three to five years, right? Don't think like an entrepreneur, think like an entertainer because the entertainer will cut songs out of the set list. The actor will cut lines from the movie script if they feel it does not fulfill the larger story or the larger emotion they are trying to develop in their audience, okay? I think one of the best examples of this is one of my favorite rappers of all time, Jay-Z. This was actually 20 years ago now, which is kind of crazy. Um, he had a song, it was called Moment of Clarity. Some of you hip hop fans here may know this song. And he compared his success to a couple other underground rappers at the time who went by the name, who go by the names of Talib Kweli and Common Sense or Common for shorthand. And so Jay-Z rapped, I dumbed down for my audience and doubled my dollars. If skill sold, truth be told, I'd probably be lyrically Talib Kweli. Truthfully, I want to rhyme like Common Sense, but I did five mil. I ain't been rhyming like Common Sense. And really think about what he's conveying here. He's like, I do have all the capability, all the skill, all the knowledge to be the most socially conscious, lyrically dense and intricate rapper you've ever heard of. I can do all that. But I realize, like I could do it just like these other rappers do. 
But I realized if I really wanted to make it big, I had to meet my audience where they were. And once I did that, guess what? I did 5 million sales of a single album and I never looked back. And just recently in the past two, three years, Jay-Z became hip hop's first billionaire, right? Because he realized the audience is what matters. And I, I, the way I like to think about this too, I, I like to think of every startup that we work with as, the, as an artist. And what you're trying to do is go from being an underground to a mainstream act. Not saying you can't be successful as an underground, but it's like, do you want to sell out basements or do you want to sell out Madison Square Garden, right? And if your answer is Madison Square Garden, then you really got to go down this path of meeting your audience where they are and really making it about them. And I think a, a, a final uh, way to think about this, some of you may have seen this graphic before, uh, the Mario graphic, right? You have small Mario, that's your potential customer. You have the flower, that's your product. You combine those two things. You have big Mario on fire, shooting fireballs, stopping over Koopa and killing bad guys. That is what you sell. You sell Mario shooting fireballs. You do not sell the flower, okay? So talk about what's going to matter to them. Don't talk about everything that you are capable of. I'm not going to, we're not going to have time today. I'm not going to cover this. Uh, it's a video. It's like about a three and a half minute video. Um, I highly recommend everyone watch this video though. So write this down. It's called Google search the reunion, like type it into YouTube, Google search the reunion. Uh, turn your closed captions on because it's in Hindi. So you'll need to know the subtitles for it. Um, and maybe Nick, if you could even just write that in the chat so we have it there. Google search the reunion. That's what you'll type into YouTube, not into Google. I know it's kind of weird because <laughs> it's an ad for Google. And I think that really conveys better than anything, the importance of making, like developing your message around the value to the end user, the end customer. Sumo seen it, yeah, you know, like people, like you'll be crying by the end of, the, of, the, the end of that video. So ultimately here, what I'm getting at is you want to see and speak from your audience's point of view. So how do we do that? Well, let's talk about getting into that elevator pitch mode. And I think the absolute best elevator pitch that has ever been created is an unlikely source, a source of entertainment, coming back to that theme. The best elevator pitch that's ever been created in my mind, timely given what's happened in the last two weeks, is the man who slapped Chris Rock, but Will Smith and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme song. Now, earlier I said you didn't realize this workshop was actually a live game show. You didn't also realize that this workshop is in addition, a live sing-along concert. So I'd like you to come off mute once again, and we are going to together sing the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme. Lags <laughs> and all, right? Because I know everyone's got different internet speeds and everything. So go ahead, if you will indulge me, go ahead and come off mute and a one and a two, and a three. Now this is a story is all about how my life got flipped got upside, down. upside down. down. I'd like to take a minute <laughs> to <laughs> right there. Right there. Right how became the, the prince of a town called Bel-Air? In West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground is where I spend most of my days. Doing out, maxing, relaxing, all cool, all shooting, shooting b-ball outside of a school with a couple of guys. We're up to no good. 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 We got one little fun. My mom got scared just as you did. I'm just going to get up to the bell. All right, I'm seen. Up to it. I know you wanted to keep it going up here. Yeah. All right, thank you all for indulging me in that. Um, and uh, thanks for joining in along with that. Um, a year ago, I did this workshop and I might, we may have set the Guinness World Record for most people live singing along with the Fresh Prince theme song on a virtual meeting. It was like a 500 person workshop. Uh, and, we, and it was like, <laughs> and, and I think 470 of those people actually came off mute and did it. It was wild because it just took, it took a while to get through with all the legs and everything, but it was, it was hilarious. Anyways, the reason why I share that with you is not just because it's a fun thong, song, but really think about it. That's his elevator pitch for the show. Why is it so memorable? Look at what he's conveying. He's saying, hey, I had this really rough upbringing in Philadelphia, and there was a good chance that if I stayed there, I was going to get involved in a lot of bad stuff. My mom recognized this early on. So she sent me to Bel Air to live with my aunt and uncle there. So that way I would be surrounded by the right family structure, have access to the right education, and overall have connections to the right resources so that ultimately I could fulfill my potential and grow into the man she knew that I was capable of becoming. That's the message that's being delivered in there. And it's 
being teased out to you. And because that is the elevator pitch, every episode of the show has context and it makes sense right away. If you never saw that introduction or heard it and you watched an episode, you'd spend the entire episode trying to piece together what's the story here. But because you've seen that or heard that before, you can watch episode one, episode 11, or episode 101, and you will know at baseline what's the overall plot and context of what's happening here. That's what your elevator pitch should do for you. It should provide the appropriate teaser, right? It's your movie trailer to your movie, and the movie can be the pitch deck or the, the larger interaction with them. Right. And I always like to say this we don't see movies if the trailer is bad. Right. You, you never say, oh my God, that movie, unless you're being ironic. Right. You don't say, oh my God, that movie looks terrible. I can't wait to go see it. Or unless it has The Rock in it, in which case we'll just see it because it's Dwayne Johnson. Um, I don't have his charm or his muscles, though. If you do, please keep doing you. Uh, but assuming we don't have The Rock and his Instagram following, um, this is why you need a really strong. And I will say, he's actually done a lot. His movies the last few years have been way better than his movies the first like 10 years of his acting career, right? So that's the importance of this pitch. So how do we actually generate an elevator pitch that's gonna captivate hearts and minds and win people over? Let's talk about formula and strategy now, okay? The first thing before we get into the creation of the elevator pitch is understanding your positioning relative to your audience. And so we use a tool, and this is what we employed with Carson and Fan Food. I was like, okay, now we got the mindset right, let's figure out the positioning. Um, is what I call the superhero positioning strategy. The idea is that you have to look at your startup as a superhero. Why? Because superheroes help and they save people. What are you doing? You're helping and you're saving people from something. Now, if you think about that through that lens, what, and, and I like to use Batman as an example because Batman, all Batman was was a combination of access to capital combined with technology to serve the public good. Does that not sound like a startup? Does that not sound like a founder, right? Capital plus technology equals serve, please serve the public good, right? You know, please stay on that path. Don't, don't go stealing data and stuff. But if you really think about Batman, like, and you can use the chat here, generally speaking, and you can use the slide as a reference, like what's going on that makes Batman come in and save the day? What's happening? that has him put on the cape and he's like, oh, I better go do something. Andy, an injustice, yeah, right? Injustice is happening, crime. The bank is being robbed. Joker has blown up the hospital, right? All of these things are happening. That's when Batman swoops in. Batman, if it's, so today in Chicago, it's like, seven, it's like almost 70 degrees, I think. You have a care in the world. You got your kids at the park. You're taking your dog for a walk. Batman's not about to swoop in and be like, oh, I'm here to save you. Because if he did, people would think he's a creep, right? <laughs> They'd be like, who are you? Why are you wearing that cape? Stay the hell away from my children. Batman doesn't do that. But you know how many founders I see will swoop in and try and save the day without it needing saving. We've got an AI powered yada, yada, yada platform. We've got a FinTech app that does these three things. You're being Batman trying to save Gotham on a sunny day if you talk like that. Batman only comes in when Gotham needs saving. So as such, the superhero positioning strategy declares that in order for you, the superhero, to exist, you have to have a few things in place first. Number one, there has to be a person in distress. After that, there is a village on fire. Once you have set the village on fire, or once the village has been set on fire, you can activate a superpower. With your superpower activated, da, 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 the superhero can come in and save the day. Or in business speak, the target audience, the core problem, your approach to that problem, and ultimately your solution, okay? This is how you're gonna develop your positioning. And you don't need to worry about how it sounds at this point. This is the precursor to building your elevator pitch. But you do this first to get the ideas out of your head in an organized fashion. With Carson and fan food, that's what we did. We said, let's get the ideas out of your head into an organized fashion. If you do this on your own, piece of paper, four columns, okay? Just, just jot things down. The reason why this is so valuable is because it's going to force you to get into that, that 
entertainer's mindset, actually, that, that thinking from their perspective, because it forces you with the target and with the person in distress in the village on fire, it forces you to think through what is the appropriate context and frame of reference for which to understand my product. But most importantly, how can I showcase empathy up front? How can I show I understand my audience first before anything else? So then once you do this, you're, you're ready to create your elevator pitch. And the formula I'll show you here in a second is, I promise you, the most simple and easy to understand, and at the same time, the most deadly effective pitch formula I think you will ever come across. And I simply call it que pasa. If you know Spanish, what does que pasa mean? Go ahead and just tell me in the chat if you know in Spanish. So this is a Spanish word. Do you know what que pasa means? Nick wrote it. Yeah. What's up? What's going on? What's happening? Yeah. That's what you're saying, right? And when you pitch, you just got to tell people what's up. Que pasa. P-A-S-A -A is the acronym here, which stands for problem, approach, solution, action. Problem, approach, solution, action. Problem, approach, solution, action. Problem, approach, solution, action. I would like everyone to come off mute once again, and I want to say, I want us to say this together. Okay, so we'll do another call and repeat. I'll say it, and then you'll respond back to me. So, problem. 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 Approach. 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 Solution. 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 Action. 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 Two more times. We'll go a little bit quicker. Problem. 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 Approach. 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 Solution. 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 Action. 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 Last time through. Good. Problem. 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 When I say approach, you say approach. approach. When I say S, you say solution. solution. And when I say A, you say action. 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 All right, awesome, awesome. Thank you very much for participating in that. You can go back on mute now, appreciate it. So collectively, we have heard problem, approach, solution, action about 21 times. Science says we are more likely to remember it now, okay? So this is your formula for your elevator pitch. And this is what is so, again, so deadly effective and so easy to remember. Why is it so effective? Because you're, you're aligning yourself with your audience out of the gate, okay? You're saying, I understand the way things are today. I get it. That sucks. I, I, I can relate. Or I can understand why that would be terrible. Here's what we do about it, right? You, you put yourself on their level first. Uh, Yara asks, can you specify approach? Yes, that's always everyone's question. Everyone's first question. Approach, think of that as your ultimate brand promise or your ultimate brand value to that specific audience. And then solution is going to be describing out what it does and how it helps at a little bit more like tactical level, but you don't want to get too in the weeds either. So approaching it as like the high level, like here's the ultimate brand promise or brand value solution. And here's how it works and how you benefit from it specifically. Action is your call to action, right? So depending on use case, that's going to change. This k pasa works fantastic as landing page copy. And in which case your action might be click to request a demo, click to talk to us, click to learn more. If you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, it'd be kind of weird to end by saying, so click to learn more. Where, where do I click? <laughs> You'd probably close by asking them a question to get them to respond in some way. I'm going to show you now three specific examples leveraging the K-PASA formula, which I think will help answer any of those fuzzy questions you might have in your head now, especially around what's the approach and what's the solution. So I want to start with a company called Cyber Papa. Okay, so this company, um, I, I'm not even going to preface what they do or anything like that because you'll see it through the pitch. Um, we figured out the superhero strategy. We deployed the K-PASA pitch. And here's what their elevator pitch turned into. Your server was hacked. You failed an audit. Your latest software update is vulnerable. Cybersecurity is serious business. It's also highly specialized. So why would you find an expert from the same place that your marketing team gets their freelance graphic designers? Meanwhile, traditional consulting firms take you through a sales process that lasts months, but you needed someone for the job like yesterday. Get vetted specialists in a fraction of the time at a time when you need it most with Cyber Papa. 
Submit your project and get started as early as the same day. We manage the team and verify all your requirements are met so you get the highest quality delivery without the headaches. Cybersecurity isn't a matter of if, but when. So when it hits the fan, go to cyberpopup.com. Put a capital letter C in the chat if you have a baseline understanding of how this company would provide value to its target audience of cybersecurity specialists, or, or rather uh, cybersecurity uh, companies who need cybersecurity, I should say, right? And why? Because of this formula, right? We were, you're able to put everything in context. You don't just jump in and say, we're a marketplace for cybersecurity experts where you can do this, this, and this, and this, this, and this. And again, this serves as the foundation, coming back to Sean Amirati's quote from the front of this presentation, right? This is the foundation for the messaging. So then the pitch deck gets built off of this. Cybersecurity, couple uh, beta customers, their traction to this point, to this point when we created this pitch was just like the founder, Christine, she had done literally like her own consulting projects that then gave her the idea to create the marketplace around this. And what did they do? They took this pitch, and they hit the pitch competition circuit. And it was pretty cool. I, I think of 2021 as the year of Christine, their founder, because here were the emails I was getting. Sidebar, 120K yesterday. Just sidebar, 20, we won 20K yesterday. And then a little bit later, won another 5K. And then a little bit later, 100K win. The next weekend after that, another 100K win. <laughs> And then she was getting written up about because of all these successes, right? In literally like news at media outlets are writing out about how she was having so much success in this. In total, last year, Cyber Pop-Up raised 250,000, I think exactly it was $251,300, I believe, purely off of pitch competitions. And all but like eight or 10K of that was non-dilutive capital that was literally just prize money. Only eight or 10K of that was an actual like, you know, equity investment. So she got all of this without being diluted either, right? And you can even like, there's some YouTube videos you can see where some of her pitches are on there. And she didn't even need to have a whole bunch of traction, but the pitch, the story was good and people saw the vision, right? Next company I'll show you, Honest Game. They were actually, they were, they were taking this workshop at one point and then they came up to me afterwards and they were like, so here's the deal. We actually don't even know if we want to raise capital. We just know that whenever we talk about our company, people get confused. And so we've got to figure this out. And if we do raise capital, we know it's going to have to be like the perfect strategic partner. We don't just want money. We want a partner. And so we started working on their pitch. And then during that time, I was like, hey, there's this opportunity I really think you should jump on. It's, you know, it's this big competition. It's sponsored by the Chicago Bulls. You're a sports tech and ed tech startup. I think it would align well with them. And the winner gets a 50K investment from this group, Loud Capital. I know the people over there. And I just think they would be not only give you money, but be the perfect strategic partners. And so they were like, okay, this looks good. Let's, let's apply. So they were actually able to, I'll come back to that story in a second. When I talk about the elevator pitch having multi-use cases, they actually took their elevator pitch and converted it into a uh, video explaining their product. Um, and so I'm going to show you their elevator pitch in the form of their video. The one thing I want to clarify with this is the captions are auto-generated, so they're wrong at a couple parts. Specifically, in the first 20 seconds or so, uh, instead of using the word compete, it says can pee, which just makes it <laughs> totally different. So, I, and I'll play the video here in a second. I know it says unavailable on the screen, but to, when you see can pee, it's supposed to be it's supposed to say compete. We get an ad for Hulu. Hulu Ad Manager is the easy way for businesses like yours to advertise. When you're a star high school student athlete, you compete tirelessly on the court and in the classroom to achieve your one dream of right playing now. in college. Top schools recruit you and even offer you a scholarship. Then senior year hits and you find out that the class you took actually doesn't count. Your GPA is .25 off or your SAT score is 10 points too low. All because your counselor, your coach, and your parents couldn't make sense of the rules. And by the time you find out, it was too late to catch up. Boom, game over. Approach. Honest game is the clear pathway for getting in. 
We automate the Solution. process so the student, the parent, the coach, the counselor, and the college all get real-time eligibility updates. With Honest Game, everyone knows what to do before it's too late. Action. In the last 20 years, total athletic scholarship money has grown from $2.5 million to over $3 billion. With the NCAA on the verge of allowing student athletes to earn money on their likeness, recruits and college coaches will more than ever need to know their eligibility status. Learn more at honestgame.com and let the dream live on. Capital letters HG in the chat. You understand how Honest Game provides value to their target audience of student athletes. Right away, awesome, All right? And this was great, right? We figured this out. We used this to build the pitch deck and they had a fantastic pitch. That competition to come back to it, um, 221 companies applied. Out of that, a top 20 was selected as semifinalists. Honest Game made it into the top 20. Out of that top 20, a top five was selected to pitch on center court at the United Center where the Bulls play in front of Bulls executives, venture capitalists from Loud Capital and other Chicago area business leaders. The next night, the winner was announced on court during the game, uh, during the first time out. And guess who was holding the big check? Honest game with a $50,000 victory. And this was from Loud Capital directly as an investment. And that was, again, it was like the perfect partnership because they've given them money, but also the right strategic uh, partnership as well. And this then paved the roadmap for them to ultimately rate, oversubscribe a $2 million round uh, a little bit after that. So big ups to Honest Game. And, uh, and I think what's crazy too is they faced other companies who had significantly more traction, monthly revenue that was in the thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. They had like five unpaid beta customers, but the story, the pitch was so good that people saw the vision. And that's what your pitch really should do, right? It should help people understand your capital V vision. Okay. Um, I, I've, I apologize. I got to run a couple minutes overtime. If you've got to jump, I totally understand. But if you can stay with me for five more minutes, um, we had a, we had to, we had a little bit of issues getting started on time because the the link stuff. Uh, but if you can give me five more minutes of your time, uh, I can take you through the last couple slides of this presentation, and I'll show you Honest Games. Um, uh, or excuse me, I'll show you Fan Food now. Okay, so coming back to Carson and Fan Food, you remember what he did the first time through? And Amir, I know you got to jump. We'll send you out the recording afterwards, and you'll get that director's cut. Thank too. you. Thank you. So coming back to Fan Food, you remember what it sounded like before? Well, here's what we transformed it to. This is probably still my favorite or one of my favorite pitches uh, that I've ever had the chance to be part of. Here's what we changed it to. As a diehard sports fan, there's nothing more frustrating than going to your favorite team's game and missing the big play because you were stuck waiting in line for a hot dog and beer. Fan food keeps you in the moment. Use our mobile ordering app and get your concession food delivered directly to your seat so you never miss a big play again. Download Fan Food in the App Store today. Capital letter F, if you have a better understanding than you did up front about why you could, about how and when and why you could use Fan Food in your life. Yeah, right? It makes so much sense now. There's no, oh, the value add is this. The value add is implied because of the K plus of formula. And what I want you all to notice with all three of these pitch examples, notice how the majority of time is actually spent describing the problem. Because when you do that, you don't actually need to spend so much time talking about your solution. My, dad, my dad's an engineer by trade and he grew up in India. And one of the things they taught engineers in India in school that I think applies here just as well is a well-defined problem is already half solved. A well-defined problem is already half solved. So if you can define that problem well, people start thinking of the solution themselves. And it's this, that's why I, I like this formula so much because it's almost like a Jedi mind trick where because you're describing, you're articulating the problem so well, they're already starting to think of the solution. So by the time you say the solution, it's already a thought they started to have in their head. And now instead of it being brand new information, it's more like you're reinforcing a thought that was original to them. 
I mean, isn't that something that's pretty powerful, right? To make, especially if you think about building familiarity and likeness towards what you're doing. And so that's the, again, that's the pitch that we developed for fan food. And so all of this said, let me just show you now, like kind of like where their journey led them. Because again, we use that to then build the pitch deck. And so let's look at the effect of great storytelling. Well, you saw Carson's video up front. Now let's look at how he was able to take that pitch and have a lot more swagger behind him or drip as the kids say today. <laughs> hey there, my name is Carson Goodell, CEO and co-founder of FanFood. Now as a diehard sports fan, there's nothing more frustrating when you're at your team's game than missing a big play because you were stuck waiting in a line for a hot dog and beer. Fan food keeps you in the moment. Our mobile ordering app brings concessions directly to your seat so you never have to miss the big play. Now we are currently live in five venues in three different states, our two largest being a major league soccer venue and the Formula One Raceway down in Austin, Texas. Download our app today on the iOS and Android store. Charm, confidence, he knows what he's saying. The only issue with this was that I, we didn't plan this. Like literally one day I just, I walked to their office and I was like, hey, I gotta film you real quick. But guess what? He was ready on the spot. But that's also why he was like, oh, I should probably wear a branded t-shirt for this. And so he like has the weird look of t-shirt on top of long sleeve collared shirt. And then I walked too fast with the camera. So then he like kind of like ran out of breath having to keep up with the pace of the camera, right? But he even finishes it with like a, instead of uh, looking to the side saying, that's it, that's all I've got now, right? And that is where these formulas and this strategy, right? The mindset, that's where it can take you. And what kind of results do they experience? Well, out of the gate, they won $1,000 in a pitch competition. Shortly after that, they won $25,000. And that prize also included an afternoon meeting with Damon from Shark Tank to get uh, direct strategy advice from him on their business model. They then let, had a successful crowdfund, and then they ultimately raised a roughly $3 million Series A round. They were able to scale the team to 30 plus with customers in the NCAA, Formula One, Major League Soccer, Minor League Baseball, Major League Baseball, and they continue to expand. And if you recall, I told you back when you know we were first figuring out what that pitch should be, we were like, man, this is what we would need at Wrigley Field for the Cubs. Well, opening day of last year, Fan food was at Wrigley Field. So I tell you all this stuff to share with you, just again, how impactful getting your story down really is and how much it can build momentum for you and how much it can get other people behind what you're doing, right? How, like the, I think the most important thing is your, your capital V vision. And the more you can put that forth, the more you can generate buzz around what you're doing and build people who believe what you believe. Carson specifically, uh, I just think it's important to know, he even says, uh, like, it's an underrated skill. Storytelling is an underrated skill. And having storytelling has made me a stronger entrepreneur. The final thing I can close out with here, if we have time and you want to stick around for it, is it's a one minute, 21 second video on his birthday a few years ago after they raised their round. I did a little uh, rap for him just to give him some big ups. So if you want to see the quick birthday rap, we can play that. Uh, just let me, I guess, in some fashion, let me know if you want to see that real quick or not. All right, Nick's saying, let's skip it since we're over time. I'll, I'll find a way to get it to you in another fashion. Um, the, uh, if there's any final questions now, go ahead and ask them now, either coming off mute or in the chat. But what I want to leave you with, and here's my contact information. And just, you know, we work with companies on this, like literally almost every day of every week. So if it's something that's on your radar, just reach out. Uh, and I'll send a follow-up email with that director's cut recording as well. But again, the parting shots that I want to leave you with are really, remember we said at the beginning, my product does not mean shit without a compelling story. Your story development is just as important as your product development and your ability to pitch your startup and not, and not suck at pitching your startup is what can create a groundswell around what you're doing. Amen. Thank you so much for the time today, Raj. Um, I love our pairing because like you said, just as important as product development, which is our focus, is your story, which is your focus. So we're such a beautiful match. Um, Raj will be sending out this, or I'll, we'll be sending out the recording with the pitch deck for you all to, uh, to, to review. And 
Uh, just as a heads up, Further Faster is going to be putting together a, a kind of an intensive in June focused on female founders who are looking to raise prior to revenue in the pre-seed seed stage. Um, we're going to get a group of amazing women together for that. Um, so share that. You'll hear about that in the next couple of weeks. Um, and again, if you all have any questions, just email me at nick at furtherfaster.ventures or Raj um, at Raj at startuphypeman. Rajiv at startuphypeman.com. Yes. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Connect with both of us on LinkedIn as well, please, if we're not already connected. Uh, I have one of those creator accounts. So to connect and not just follow me, you got to like click the drop down and say connect. And otherwise, it just the default is just follow. You can yeah. also follow, but I'd also like to connect. Following's fine too. Yeah. All right. Let's all stay in touch. And thank you again for everybody for stopping by. Appreciate everybody. Thank you for being here. And thanks for sticking around for a few extra minutes. Have a killer Tuesday, y'all.